dear brothers and sisters in Christ, today we celebrate the solemnity of the most sacred heart of Jesus. And it is the Friday after the solemnity of the body and blood of Christ. And it is also the 19th day after Pentecost. So during the uh, 17th century, it was to a, through a humble nun in France named Margaret Mary that Jesus chose to reveal to the world about his sacred heart. Even before that, there were many other saints who preached about the sacred heart of Jesus, but it was Margaret Mary who was directly chosen by Jesus to spread the message of his sacred heart. So based on the multiple visions that she received from Jesus, the church has instituted this feast as a universal celebration. So now the image of the sacred heart of Jesus, I'm sure all of you have an image of the sacred heart in your homes. And even from childhood, you've been so familiar with this image, whether it is at church or in our homes. So we are very familiar, right? So what does this image of the sacred heart of Jesus mean to you? Have you ever thought about it? Or is it just another image of Jesus framed and hung on your wall? So brothers and sisters, what is this sacred heart of Jesus telling each one of us? In very simple words, Jesus is telling us telling you and me, I love you. So the heart is a very commonly used symbol to depict love. Whether it is Valentine's Day or whether it is an emoji, we always use the heart as a sign of love. So the heart of Jesus was used by God as a sign of his love for us. So that is what the sacred heart of Jesus means. It is a symbol, a sign of love. Now, when you look at the sacred heart of Jesus, what, what comes to your mind? Why did God use the heart as a symbol of love? The heart is a center of our lives. It's the totality of a person. It is not just a part of us, but it is who we are. So the heart of Jesus, it is the union of his divinity and his humanity. It is his core. The, the heart of Jesus is not just a physical organ that we're talking about. It is not just a part of Christ, but it is Christ himself. So let us take um, a look at the image of the sacred heart of Jesus. Sometimes we are over familiar with this image that you know, we hardly get time to pay attention to the details. So when you look at the image of the sacred heart, at the first glance, what do you see? We see there is a cross, there is a crown of thorns, encircling the heart. There is a pierced heart and there is blood dripping down. There are rays of light around the heart. And then there is um, flames right above the heart. Now the cross, the crown of thorns and the pierced heart, what do they remind us of? The crucifixion, right? the passion, death, and suffering of Jesus. So why is the cross depicted in the heart? Have you ever wondered what is the connection between the heart and the cross? Margaret Mary says that crucifixion cannot be understood apart from the heart of Jesus. It is the heart of Jesus that makes the cross meaningful for us. Brothers and sisters in Christ, it was on the cross that Jesus demonstrated 
his love for us. Now let's come to the crown of thorns. According to the scripture, we know that the crown of thorns was placed on the head of Jesus. But here we see that it is around the heart of Jesus. Jesus himself revealed the meaning of this to Margaret Mary. He said that the thorns around the heart of Jesus signify our sins. And just like how the thorns prick in the same way, our sins prick the heart of Jesus. So they are the sufferings that Jesus endures on our account. Then we notice that the, the pierced heart of Jesus with blood dripping down. It points to the reality that Jesus was pierced on the side of his heart at the time of crucifixion. In the Gospel of John chapter 19, verse 34, we read, one of the soldiers plunged the spear into Jesus' side and at once blood and water poured out. So there is great meaning in this. It was a blood that was shed as a price for our redemption. And also the greater meaning behind this, the church fathers and the theologians have you know, explained about it in two ways mainly. They have tried to uh, explain it and link it, link the side of Jesus with the side of Adam. Now Jesus, who is called the new Adam, from his side, he formed the church, which is his bride. Just like how God formed the bride of Adam, that is Eve, from his side, in the same way, Jesus' bride, the Christ, was formed from his side. Again, uh, many other church fathers have linked the blood and water that flowed from the heart of Jesus to two sacraments, especially St. John Chrysostom. He links the water to the sacrament of baptism and the blood to the sacrament of the Eucharist. So St. John uh, Chrysostom says that it is from these two sacraments that the church was born. From baptism, the cleansing water that gives rebirth and renewal through the Holy Spirit and from the Holy Eucharist. So it means that it was out of the love of Jesus that the church was born. And what about the fire, the, the flames above the heart of Jesus? There are three main reasons why the flames are depicted on the sacred heart. The first reason is that fire represented a burnt offering which was the highest form of sacrifice in the Old Testament. And the fire here reminds us of Jesus who offered himself as the ultimate sacrifice on the cross. The second reason for the fire is that the fire represents the presence of the div divinity. Even in the Old Testament, for example, when God spoke to Moses in the burning bush, the cloud of fire which settled at Mount Sinai and the flames that came upon the sacrifice of Elijah. All these imply the presence of God through fire. Now the third reason, the most important reason why we can find flames on top of the heart is because it signifies the passionate love that Jesus has for us. It shows that the heart of Jesus is burning with love for us. That is the intensity of his love. So these are some of the things that we can observe when we look at the sacred heart of Jesus. So apart from what we can see, the visible um, features we saw right now, 
what else, what is the underlying message that Jesus is telling us through his most sacred heart? You know, Jesus is giving us an up close and personal view of his interior self. He's showing us his heart and telling us what's in his heart. Just imagine, dear brothers and sisters, if we were asked to show others what was in our heart, if we were to give a transparent view of our heart, how would it be? Would people still love us the same way? Would they still look, us, look at us in the same way that they do right now? But Jesus, in spite of knowing our heart, in spite of knowing the sinful nature, whatever is there in our heart, he loves us. So when we look at the heart of Jesus, he's not only telling us that he loves us, but he's also giving us a personal invitation to come and experience that love. He's telling us that he is an approachable God, an accessible God, not a distant God who is far away, high up above in the clouds. No, he's near you. And all that he is asking you is to come to him and to enjoy the fullness of his love. Now in the Bible, among all the four gospels, there is only one place where Jesus tells us about his love. In the gospel of Matthew, chapter 11, verse 29. In the second part, Jesus says, Learn from me, for I am meek and humble of heart. Yes, in some translation, it says gentle and lowly. Now, these are the words that Jesus uses to describe his heart. The almighty, the all-powerful God uses such simple and humble words to describe his heart. He could have said that his heart is glorious or supreme or you know, all-powerful, but he chose to use such simple words lowly, gentle, and humble, because that is the very nature of the heart of Jesus. And he is drawing all of us to that humble heart. And he says, learn from me, for I am gentle and humble of heart. So what can we learn from the sacred heart of Jesus? There are many things we can learn, but today, I would like to share with you five things that we can learn from the sacred heart of Jesus. The first thing is that the sacred heart of Jesus is personal. It is the love that Jesus has for you and me as individuals, not as a group, because Jesus knows us by name. In Isaiah, we read that even during the praise and worship, we heard that Jesus, God says, I have called you by name, you are mine. So this is a personal relationship that we are having with the heart of Jesus. It's a heart to heart connection. And Jesus loves me. He loves you. He loves each one of us. He knows our hearts. He knows the heart of each individual. So it is at that very personal level that Jesus loves us. The second thing is that the heart of Jesus is a patient heart. It is a waiting heart. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4, we read that love is patient. The heart of Jesus is full of love. So it is a patient heart. It is not aggressive. It doesn't force itself upon you. But it waits for you. In Revelations chapter 3 verse 20, Jesus says, Behold, 
I stand at the door knocking. If any of you hear my voice and open the door, I will dine with him and he with me. So today, dear brothers and sisters, Jesus is knocking at the door of your heart. Are you listening? Are you ready to open your heart for Jesus? To let him come in? The third thing about the sacred heart of Jesus is that it is real. It is not a myth. It is not an idea. But we're talking about the real heart of Jesus. Because Jesus is alive. The same Jesus who died for us on the cross and who rose again. It is that same Jesus who is showing his heart to us and calling us to commune with him. This is not a past memory that we're talking about. It is the real heart of Jesus. What a beautiful thought. The next thing about the sacred heart of Jesus is that it is a giving heart. Why does Jesus draw us closer to him? Is it to get anything out of us? No, it is only to give. He wants to give us, give us love, give us gifts, give us blessings, graces, healing, whatever we need, he's ready to give. He doesn't want anything out of us. He doesn't expect anything from us. It is an unconditional giving heart and it has no limits. And from this, we can learn that we should have the same kind of love towards others. We should have that giving heart towards others. Often at times, we love others with expectations that they will love us back, that they will love us in this way. But Jesus through his sacred heart is teaching us that you should love without expectations. The next thing about the sacred heart of Jesus is that it is a merciful heart. Dear brothers and sisters, the love that Jesus has for you and me is the love that we don't deserve. It's an unmerited love. Yes, we don't deserve it, but still he is ready to love us beyond measure. And this merciful love is what we should learn from. Jesus says in Luke chapter 6, verse 36, be merciful like my father is merciful. It means to love those who don't love you. To love those who hate you, who curse you. And again, in Luke chapter 27, verse 36, Jesus says, if you love only those who love you, what credit is that to you? And if you do good only to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? So that is the kind of love that we can learn from, that we have to practice the giving love, the merciful love. And for this, we have to take refuge in the heart of Jesus. Now that we've learned about the heart of Jesus, we've learned what, the, what kind of heart it is. We've, you know, it's like we've learned the theory. So what about the practicals? Is it easy to practice what we learned? Is it easy to practice and you know, be, have a merciful giving heart, a heart that is perfectly in love with Jesus? Yes, it is. Because that is someone who showed us how to love God in a perfect way. It is our Blessed Mother. Mother Mary is a model of perfect love towards God. Tomorrow we celebrate the solemnity of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. 
So the two feasts of the Sacred Heart and the Immaculate Heart are very close to each other because their hearts are also very close to each other. So why does Jesus want uh, to venerate the heart of his mother alongside his heart? Because it was in the womb of Mary that the heart of Jesus first began to beat. And when the heart of Jesus began to beat, the heart of Mary and Jesus were beating in union. And God chose the womb of Jesus, womb of Mary, to place the heart of his son. And it was from Mary that Jesus received his body and blood. So uh, let's take a look at the picture of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. I don't know if this picture is as popular as the Sacred Heart of Jesus. I don't know if you have a picture of the Immaculate Heart of Mary at home. So this is very well explained. Look at the heart, Immaculate Heart of Mary. Her heart is a symbol of the maternal love that she had for Jesus. And the fire shows the intensity of the love that she has for Jesus. The sword shows the sufferings and the sorrows that she went through. And the rose, they represent her purity, her holiness. So now how did this um, devotion come to be? The devotion of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. So during the 17th century, St. John Youths, he was the one who preached about the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And later, it was uh, Sister Lucia to whom Mother Mary appeared in her vision and expressed the desire of her son that Jesus wants the heart of his mother to be honored and to be devoted to and to seek refuge in her immaculate heart for the salvation of souls. And so in 1944, Pope Pius XII instituted this feast. Now the devotion to the sacred heart and the immaculate heart, there is a difference between the two devotions. When we talk about the sacred heart of Jesus, you're talking about the love that Jesus had for mankind, for us. And when we talk about the Immaculate Heart of Mary, we're talking about the love that she had for Jesus, for God. Not that she doesn't love us, but we are honoring her love for Jesus, for God. And Mary is the intermediary between us and God so that we can unite with God. And also, when we talk about the sacred heart of Jesus, the emphasis is on the physical sufferings, the crucifixion, the uh, crown of thorns, and all the physical sufferings that Jesus went through. And when we talk about the immaculate heart of Mary, the emphasis is on the spiritual sufferings, the sorrows, that she endured for the love of Jesus. So in honoring the Immaculate Heart of Mary, we are honoring the fact that she was chosen by God to be the mother of God. We venerate her extraordinary holiness, her virtues, her interior life, her joys and sorrows. And we take refuge in her. We try to imitate her life so that we can love Jesus just like how she did. So today on the Feast of the Most Sacred Heart of Jesus, I urge you, brothers and sisters, to increase your devotion to the Most Sacred Heart. There are some specific practices and devotions to the Sacred Heart which many of you might have already been doing and many of you might already know, like making a formal consecration to the Sacred Heart, praying the 
Litany of the Sacred Heart, the nine consecutive First Friday devotion, a daily offering to the Sacred Heart, consecrating your families to the Sacred Heart. If there are any families out there who are lacking peace, if there is a lack of peace between spouses, lack of peace between parents and children, between relatives, I encourage you all to dedicate and consecrate your families to the most sacred heart of Jesus. And he will establish peace in your families. This is a promise that he gave to Margaret Mary. During the last week, we already heard about the promises that Jesus gives to those who honor his heart through Margaret Mary. And there are many other indulgences approved by the Pope, so you don't want to miss it. So how do these uh, practices and devotions help us? Are they magic tickets to heaven? They help us in growing closer to Jesus, in falling more and more in love with the lover of our souls. So along with the practices and the devotions, let us not forget to make a heart-to-heart -heart connection with Jesus. And let us learn from his heart how to be like him, how to love others like he loves us. And for this, let us seek the intercession of our Blessed Mother and imitate her ways so that we too can love Jesus just as she did. May all glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen.